All right, let's go ahead and get started. We'll see if anybody else uh, pops in. Um, if you've got any questions while I'm going along, feel free to, to chime in. I wanted to take a minute to talk about uh, the phases of the moon activity because we've been uh, trying to do something where we're comparing the three-dimensional model of our solar system with what we might observe on the night sky. And we have a couple of programs that we can use to help with that. Uh, one of them is Stellarium, which is a program you've already downloaded. This, this program uh, is the thing that lets you view the night sky. And I'm looking at uh, right around 9.30 this morning uh, at the sun and the moon, and we'll come back and talk about those observations in just a second. Uh, the other program which you haven't uh, had a chance to download yet is called Celestia. And Celestia is a little bit different than Stellarium. Celestia is a program that lets you model the uh, solar system in three dimensions. So um, it's a full-scale model of the solar system. You're basically a little spacecraft. Uh, you can zoom around the solar system. You can actually zoom around uh, anywhere. You can go anywhere in the galaxy. It's pretty cool. But we're going to use this to kind of show uh, what uh, uh, what the Earth and the Moon look like uh, from space. And uh, this is the Sun over here, right? Where's my Sun? This is the Sun right here. I oh, guess it's not going to let me draw on that. <laughs> There's the Sun right there, and the Earth is right over here, and the Moon is uh, just barely where you can't see it. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and zoom in on the Earth. And again, this is at about the same time. I can center on the Earth, and then I can kind of zoom in, and you can see there is the Earth and the Moon. So there's the Earth. And you can just barely see it over here as the Moon. I don't know if you can see it on our resolution here, but that's the that's the Moon. And I can I can kind of rotate around like this to show you uh, what uh, the phases of the Moon looks like. So you can use Celestia to kind of see what uh, the the Earth Moon system looks like in three dimensions. There's our Moon over there. There we go. So I can zoom in on the Moon little bit and you can see its position relative to the Sun. There's the Sun right there. So you can sort of see the relationship between the those uh, those objects in the sky. So Celestia is a program we're going to use uh, when we start talking about the solar system but you can use it to play around with the uh, uh, the positions of the Earth, Moon, and the Sun. And it tells you the time up here so you can even match it to Stellarium and uh, and see what's going on. But Stellarium will let you see what the actual observations look like. So let's fire that guy up and put that on full screen so it's easier to see. So I've got this pretty much set for this morning and you can see the Sun is right over here. So here's the Sun over here and you have the Moon right over here and this is for this morning. So if you were to go out uh, right now you should be able to catch the moon just setting in the western sky right? and that means that we know that this moon has got to be it can't be the full moon because it has to set exactly when the sun rises and the sun is already up but it's a little bit past full because it's uh, it's it's setting just after the sun comes up and so this if I click on the moon I should be able to see should tell me its phase up here and its phase is, go down here, phase angle, its phase is 0.75%. So it's 75%, so it's not for full moon, which would be 100%. Uh, it's just uh, past that at 0.75 or 75%. So we can use Stellarium to see what happens uh, on given days. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to fire up my date and time window, and I'm going to go back a couple of days about the 15th let's say and then I'm gonna look at sunrise and we see there is the moon right there right so there's the full moon right there if I click on that it says it's 99 percent illuminated its phase full moon and the Sun is below the horizon and if I go ahead and play this forward the moon should should set right when the sun rises. So there's the moon gone, there's the sun just popping up. And you can even see uh, Venus, Saturn, and Mars here in a line. So we can sort of set up to see what is the phase associated with where the sun is uh, through using Stellarium. So if it helps with the with the activity, you can use Stellarium to sort of set things up. Uh, for example, one of the questions, I think it's question seven, indicated that uh, you have the, the um, 
moon on your left and the sun on your right looking south, right? And it asks you what time that was. So in this case, I'm looking south and I have the moon on my right and the sun on my left. So I just know that I can go forward until I switch those things around because I want the moon on my left and the sun on my right. So I put the sun on my right, let the sun go down, and the moon should pop up on my left. Let's see if it when it comes up here. There it is, right there. There's the moon over there. And I can use Stellarium to check the time, and it is around 6 p.m. So you can see the relationship between the setting sun and the rising moon, uh, which is what that picture is depicting. Okay, so hopefully Stellarium will kind of help with uh, some of those uh, questions. First of all, uh, some of the lunar phases, let's just review some of these questions because I think they're, they're an important part of, of training your brain to visualize uh, astronomy because we see things in two dimensions on the sky and then we create a model of what they are in three dimensions and going back and forth between those things can be really helpful. Okay, so what we're looking at here is a picture of uh, from your activity of the lunar phases. Here's the moon right here, here's the earth right here, and here's the sun. And I know that this is a full phase because this half is illuminated by the sun and it's opposite the sun and the phase that's opposite the sun is the full phase. We know that the earth rotates counterclockwise like that and if we're looking down on the north pole right there and this is you kind of standing here, you know that you're turning with the earth like this going around and around and around. Uh, so if you imagine you're that little stick and let's say you're facing south so you're facing into the page here then if I hold out my left hand, I will be pointing at the moon. So that's my left hand. If I point out my right hand, I'm looking at the sun. And I'm rotating this way. And since the horizon is going to obscure anything beneath it, as we rotate this way, eventually, if I were to rotate over here, I wouldn't be able to see the sun anymore. It would be below the horizon. I would be able to see the moon. It's above the horizon. That means the sun is setting. The moon is rising. So we know that things set in the west and they rise in the east. So your left hand is pointing east, your right hand is pointing west, and that stays throughout this entire rotation. right? And we know it's 6 p.m. because that's when the sun sets. So the answer to this one is 6 p.m. Okay, so if we go to the next question though, um, what phase is it? Well, you knew this from uh, the fact that it was a full phase, uh, the fact that it's exactly opposite from the sun. Uh, but now let's change the configuration a little bit. Let's put the uh, moon up there. Okay. So the first question is here, what time is it? Now again, with our little clock that we have, we can say that the you're the stick, north is right here, you're facing into the page, so you're facing south. That means your right hand is west, and your left hand is east and that never changes. That's just like what you had before, right? West is to, the, to your right, east is to the left. Everything below the horizon you can't see, so that means the moon is setting, right? The moon is setting at this time. The sun is directly underneath your feet, so that means the time has to be midnight, right? Has to be 12 a.m. because that's what's right beneath your, your you're at halfway through uh, this rotation between uh, noon and midnight, right? So that's how we know this is 12 a.m. If you were standing over here, it'd be 12 p.m. If you're standing here, it's 6 p.m. If you're standing here, it's 6 a.m., right? Because the Earth rotates like this. So that tells you what time it is, right? It has to be midnight. And then the question is, what phase is it? Well, you can go and look at your uh, activity and remind yourself that the phase is first quarter because we now know that the moon goes around like this and this would be your new phase this would be your full phase your one quarter of the way around the circle so this is first quarter right so it's first quarter so if you know the phase of the moon you know where the moon is in the sky you can tell what time it is uh, which is pretty handy Okay, so practice those things. Uh, those are they're, they're fun little things to make your brain uh, 
figure out how to do these three-dimensional modeling. And again, if you can use Stellarium or Celestia, uh, I'll post the link for Celestia on our on our activity. Um, that can give you an idea of visualizing where these things are. Okay, questions about lunar phases before we head out. Okay. So let's remind ourselves of a quick summary of Kepler's laws because Kepler was the one who told us how things moved. He didn't tell us why. We're going to do that today. Uh, but he told us how things moved. Uh, remember, he's, uh, he, was, he made the intellectual leap to say that planets move in ellipses instead of circles with the sun at one focus. Uh, planets move faster when closer to the sun and slower when they're further away. So that gave us our equal areas law. And there was also a direct relationship between the planet's period and its semi-major axis, which meant if you could measure the period, how long it took it to go around the sun, which is easy to measure, you could figure out how far away it was, at least scaled to the Earth's orbit of one astronomical unit. Uh, so Kepler's laws not only explain the motions of the planets, but he also gave us the scale of the solar system. So for the first time ever, we knew that if we were one unit away from the sun, the uh, that Jupiter was five units away from the Sun, so Jupiter was five times further away. Mars was about one and a half times further away. Uh, Saturn was ten times further away. Uh, so that was pretty exciting. But Kepler didn't really do anything to tell us why this was. This was just what, what matched the data. So enter Isaac Newton. Right? Isaac Newton uh, was a scientist in the 1700s who uh, thought very deeply about pretty much everything. Uh, and he uh, had a lot of time to do this because there was the Great Plague going on, the Black Death at that time, and he sequestered himself uh, at an estate outside of uh, the cities. Uh, and he pretty much didn't have anything to do but sit around and think about stuff. Uh, he was about 24 years old when he invented calculus uh, because he needed calculus and it hadn't been invented yet. So uh, he just made it up and uh, used it to understand the motions of objects. And he started by asking himself some pretty uh, uh, interesting questions. For example, what causes the motions of objects on the Earth? Why do things move at all? Um, what causes the motions of objects in the solar system? And then the intellectual leap that he made was he didn't think there should be any difference, right? The thing that let a ball uh, roll on the Earth or fall on the Earth should be the same as what keeps the Moon in orbit around the Earth and the Earth in orbit around the Sun. Uh, and so he he had uh, he was describing these. Uh, these ideas and thinking about these questions uh, while he was uh, sequestered at this estate. And he came up with three laws. Um, the first one was a bit of a, a departure from what people thought before. Uh, he said that Newton, the, Newton's first law was that objects at rest tend to stay at rest unless they're acted on by an outside force. And also objects in motion tend to stay in motion unless acted on by an outside force. And this was a uh, a leap of insight because until then you know you can do this experiment for yourself just grab something on your desk and slide it it comes to a stop right it doesn't just keep going and people thought that it was the natural tendency for things to be at rest and if you push them they'd eventually go back to rest uh, well Newton with some help from Galileo and some other folks worked out that no it's friction that causes things to stop that's a force that's acting on the object that causes things to stop uh, if there was no force no friction uh, things would slide indefinitely and you can do experiments on ice where you can slide a hockey puck across ice and it'll go and go and go and go because there's very little frictional force on the ice so an object at rest will remain at rest unless you act on it. So he had this notion of agency, the fact that stuff has to uh, be acted on before things will happen. And if you don't act on it, nothing changes. Uh, the second thing is he d discovered a property of matter that we call inertia. And uh, we measure inertia by measuring the mass of stuff that we have in matter. And the second law just states that the force required to accelerate an object depends only on its mass. And he wrote these wrote this down mathematically uh, to say that uh, the force, which is this guy right here, measured in uh, uh, the, the English unit of force is pounds. We use newtons in, uh, in the metric system. Can be calculated by taking the mass of the object Right, so this is how many kilograms it has, and multiplying it by what acceleration results from the force, or F equals ma. Another way to write this is to say that the mass of an object is equal to the ratio of the force to acceleration. So if I know how hard I push something and I measure how fast it sped away from me, I know what its mass is. 
and this is uh, this is interesting because we don't really know what mass is we just know that it's a property of matter that can be measured by applying a force and measuring an acceleration uh, so mass is kind of a mystery where we pick stuff up all the time we think we know what it is um, we think we know what mass is but all we can really do is measure it by picking it up and weighing it right we can measure the mass by applying a force in the case of a scale we apply a gravitational force um, we balance that on our scale and measure off the mass right um, so it's kind of a mystery uh, that uh, that what mass is we don't really know but we can measure it and that's the important thing okay and then his third law was or is uh, for every force there is an equal and opposite reactive force in other words no force acts alone uh, for example if I were to take this water bottle and set it on a scale right everything's in balance the gravity is pulling it down the table or my hand in this case is pushing it up so that the net force is zero because remember if there's no force nothing moves so there has to be a net force of zero on this water bottle otherwise uh, it's it's going to either go up or down the fact that it's not going up at all uh, tells me that there is a uh, uh, zero net force acting on this. That means there has to be a balancing force. The force pulling it down and the force pushing it up. The interesting thing about that is that I can hold this water bottle up against the gravitational force of an entire planet, which just tells you how weak the gravitational force is. Um, but what's really holding this up is the electrostatic or sorry electromagnetic interactions between the atoms in my body and this water bottle. And so there's really a uh, uh, a force being my hand is pushing up on the bottle with the force of my atoms that is equal to the gravitational force of the entire planet pulling this uh, this bottle down uh, but we know there has to be equal and opposite forces because it's not moving therefore there has to be a net force of zero so the force going up and the force going down have to cancel and balance exactly um, okay so those are the uh, the the tenets of Newton's laws uh, you have to act on something to get it to move. It doesn't change its uh, motion on its own. Uh, and by change its motion, I mean it doesn't accelerate. You can move at a constant velocity and apply no force. And you've, you've tried that if you're coasting in your car and you don't have the accelerator on. Uh, you're not increasing your speed. You're not decreasing your speed. Uh, but it's, uh, but it's, you're still moving. It's just you have a constant velocity. Uh, the force required to move something depends only on its mass, so it's a great way of measuring things. Uh, and there always has to be two forces. If a force is acting down and the object isn't moving, like say it's resting on the table, there has to be a force acting up uh, to compensate because the net force has to be zero if it's just resting there on the table. Okay, so that's Newton's three laws uh, that governs how everything moves on the Earth. And what Newton's insight was, was to say, hey, wait a second, if that's the way things work on the Earth, why would it be any different for things in the solar system or things in the galaxy? And this was Newton's great insight, was to connect the physics of what was happening on the Earth that we could experiment with and measure to the physics of what was happening in the sky. Uh, this was also incredibly heretical, right? Because up there's heaven and down here is Earth, and those two things don't have the same laws. Well, um, turns out they do. So Newton invented a force called gravity, uh, or I should say he described a force called, called gravity, which works uh, from massive objects, that uh, causes the force that keeps stuff in orbit around each other in space. And he related this to falling objects. So if you take a ball and drop it, it falls to the Earth. Right? And that was something, an observation that you can make uh, in Newton's, uh, the apocryphal story with Newton is that an apple fell on his head under a tree. We don't know if that happened or not, but I'm sure he watched objects fall and uh, determined that gravity, the stuff he called gravity, was pulling the object down. But then he did a little thought experiment. He said, okay, well, let's try this. If instead of dropping the object, let's say I shot it out of a cannon from a top of a really tall mountain. If I did that, it would follow a parabolic arc and hit the Earth. And if I could throw it faster, it would follow a larger parabolic object or parabolic arc and hit the Earth. And if I did it even faster, right, you see where this is going, eventually it would be falling further and further away, right, until such time that I threw it fast enough 
that its rate of fall was the same curvature as the curvature of the circular Earth, and it never, ever, ever hit the ground, right? And it would just go around and around and around like that. So the the you would throw it fast enough so effectively the Earth was falling away at the same rate the ball was falling away, and it would just never hit. And this is what's called free fall in orbit, right? And the faster you throw it, the bigger the orbit you can get, right? So you can be at various uh, distances. You can stay falling around the Earth at those different uh, altitudes. Uh, we have demonstrated this beautifully by launching stuff into space, and it stays in orbit around the Earth pretty much on its own. We have GPS satellites, communication satellites, military satellites, research satellites, all flying around the planet Earth in orbit without having to do anything. They just orbit the planet Earth from the gravitational force. The gravitational force is pulling them down. Their velocity is keeping them going forward. And since the Earth is a ball, it's not pulling it down fast enough to catch up with the curvature of the Earth, and you're in free fall. You're still being acted on by gravity. It's just uh, everything, your, your spacecraft, you, everything aboard the ship is falling at the same rate. And so it feels like you're weightless because you're just falling, just like if you were to jump off of a seven-story building. You would be weightless for a while until you hit the ground. Uh, the beauty about satellites is you just never hit the ground. So this connected the physics of the Earth with the physics of space, and that's why it was so exciting. Newton went on a little bit further to recognize that if he uh, looked at the orbits of the planets and he looked at the way Kepler's laws, the mechanics of Kepler's laws worked, he could write down a mathematical relationship between uh, the properties of the things that are orbiting and the force that was generated. So the uh, he, he imagined this situation where you have uh, two objects. You've got a massive object here and a massive object here and they're different masses so I've got one is little m and one is big M. You draw the distance between their centers as big R here and I can write down a relationship that the force that those two objects experience is some constant G times the mass of both of them together divided by R squared and after about four centuries of measurement we now know that G is this value a very small number 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 in units of Newton meter squared per kilogram squared uh, this number was not known to Newton, right? He just knew that there was some some constant of proportionality that measured the strength of the force of gravity, uh, and it took us a lot of years of experiment to measure this value. And in fact, we're still measuring it. I have a friend who uh, who measures it to about one part in ten to the thirteen, and trying to test to see if Newton was right. So far, he is. Uh, that's how the gravitational force works. And uh, but you can't derive this. Uh, this equation. It, it doesn't, it's not something that comes from other first principles uh, until we get to Einstein, which we'll talk about that later. But Einstein, or, uh, Newton looked at the data and said this is the way it has to work to make Kepler's laws pan out. And so this gave us the why behind, or the I should say, yeah, the why behind Kepler's how. So Kepler told us how things moved, they move in ellipses. Newton told us why because of gravity. Uh, the cool thing about this, and this gets into our next activity, is that you can use this and the fact that things fall in a gravitational field to measure the mass of the Earth at your house with a marble and a stopwatch, which is what we're going to do a little bit later. I just think that's pretty cool. Uh, okay, some, some of the mathematics for this I just want to walk through because I think it's important to see how this goes. Um, if we look at this equation, we can look at it and say, all right, if I make the mass bigger, since the mass is on the top, if I don't change anything else but the mass of one of the objects, the force between the two is going to get bigger. And that's because it's, it's in the numerator. Sorry, yeah, it's in the numerator. So it, uh, the bigger M is, the bigger F is. If M goes up, the force goes up. Right? So that's just the first observation we can make about this. The second one is since the radius or the distance between them is in the denominator, if I make that bigger, since it's in the bottom, that means that the force is going to go down right? because it's in the bottom. So the question is by how much? right? Uh, and we have a little uh, description of, or a little math to work out to see how that goes.
Okay, so if I take the, uh, uh, just to calculate the force, the raw force between the Earth and the Moon, I can take this equation right here. This is my uh, Newton's law where I have G, right? G is my constant. I've got M, which is the mass of the Earth in kilograms. I've got the mass of the Moon in kilograms. And I have the radius between, the, the distance between the two of them squared. If I look up all those numbers, I can put them in here, square the bottom one down here, right? That's going to give me these two numbers right here. And if I calculate that out, I get about 10, 2 times 10 to the 20 Newtons as the force between the Earth and the Moon. Now, to to keep that uh, in perspective, a liter of water, the force, uh, the I should say the, the, the weight of a liter of water is the acceleration due to gravity on Earth, which is about 10, times uh, one kilogram, which is how much a liter of water weighs, which means 10 newtons is about the weight of this water bottle, right? So if this is 10 newtons, the force between the Earth and the Moon is 10 to the 20 times larger than that, right? which seems enormous because it is. These objects are huge, right? Uh, but it's a very weak force because it takes the mass of planets like the Earth and the Moon to get a force that large, right? So the raw numbers don't really tell us much. What really what we want to know is how things change as we increase the distance or increase the mass, right? So let's do an example where we look at um, the Earth and the Moon, and we make the distance between them twice as big. Okay, so this is the Earth and the Moon, and I'm going to make the distance twice as big. So we're going to take the distance and do it two times. So the way I do this, and this is uh, this is formally just the way I would do it, uh, because I think it makes uh, makes it clear what's happening here. But I write down two situations. I imagine the situation we just calculated, right? which is the Earth and the Moon at their current distance from each other. And then I write down the Earth and the Moon at two times their current distance, right? Like that. Now, if you wanted to, you could go and plug in the numbers for both equations. You'd get two numbers. You could divide them to see how they relate to each other. But why go through all that mess when I could just divide the two equations right here? And if I do that, you'll notice that all of these things are the same, so they cancel out. The Gs go away. The masses go away. The R's go away, and because this is really now, uh, well, this is one over R squared, one over one over two R squared, and one over R squared. That gives me this right here, right? Because those uh, fractions are are dividing each other, I can flip them around to get this. My R's are going to cancel, and I wind up with simply two squared over one, which is four, right? Which tells me that the force here right, F1 is four times greater than the force here where I'm twice as far away. So if we make R bigger, the force goes down, right? But it goes down by the distance squared. So once you know that, you can answer it for any of us. If I say that the uh, moon is three times further away, then you know that the force uh, three times further away and the force uh, where it is now, there's going to be a factor of 9 difference between those because that's 3 squared. If I say it's 4 times further away, it's 16 and so on. So once you know about this r squared part, uh, you can just square uh, the factor that things are, are getting bigger or smaller and figure out what the ratio of the forces are. So the force drops off like uh, 1 over uh, the distance squared and the force goes up by the mass proportionate to the mass. So another example you could do which will become relevant in our um, when we start talking about exosol extrasolar planets is you can imagine well what happens if I took the mass of the Earth and made it uh, twice what it is but I left the size of the planet the same. So if I kept the mass of the Earth uh, the same uh, or the radius, the size of the Earth the same, but increase the mass, what would happen to the gravity? Well, if I look at this equation up here, I can see that it depends on the mass of the Earth in the numerator, so I can just replace that by two times that mass, and then I will have that the force with 2m is just going to be equal to two times the force with the original m, because I've just increased this factor by a factor of two. So you, you, will, you will be twice as heavy 
on a planet that has twice the mass if it has the same radius. Now the radius probably won't stay the same if we increase the mass, but we can do it that way. Okay. So John, yeah, go for it. Really yeah. Um, so we're talking about gravity and, and the moon. Um, is the moon falling as well? Yeah. And it's just set it in motion is what I, I guess I'm asking the question is what set it in motion? Oh, that's a fantastic question. Um, we're going to talk about that when we talk about solar system formation, but the it's the mm -hmm. it's the original motion of the atoms that made up the solar system that gave all the objects in the solar system their original velocities. And this comes about because our solar system was formed from a giant cloud of dust and gas that collapsed. And when it collapses, it speeds up in its spinning. And then as objects form in the, this, they have their uh, they have their orbital velocity. So it's falling, but it has that velocity to keep it in orbit. But that's a great question because, and that was Newton's question also, why, you know, this, this explains once you get the moon going, how, how it stays up there without falling down. But the question of how it got going in the first place uh, is what we'll hit when we do solar system formation. So that's, yeah, that's a great question. But you're right, if it wasn't moving and I just had two objects, they would just fall and smash into each other, right? So you need that right. motion. Uh, and we'll find out that that motion uh, kind of falls out naturally from the gravity of collapsing clouds. Uh, and if you think about it, one of the, um, you might have had this experience if you've ever, uh, you know, been on a, on a platform that spins and if you haul your arms in or if you throw your arms out, uh, you can change your rate of rotation. So if you imagine this this kind of cloud of dust and gas is just barely, barely moving, but it's being hauled together by gravity, it will begin to speed up its rotation as it collapses. And that's what causes things to spin. So you can take something that really starts with just random motion and get it spinning really fast when you make it small. And we'll talk about that when we get to uh, solar system formation. But good question. Sure. Anything else? No, oh, that's it. All right. Okay, so let's uh, real quickly just uh, uh, review why gravity is important and what we're going to do with this uh, this this week. Um, the cool thing about gravity is it's another way to see stuff in nature. Uh, I can determine uh, how massive something is by how its gravitational force influences other objects. Uh, so, for example, uh, Uranus was a planet that we didn't know about, but we measured the uh, the perturbations to other planets in the solar system and predicted there should be a planet there and then went and looked for it. And then we found that there was a planet there that was gently tugging on all the other planets and so we could predict its existence by looking at its influence on the other objects. Uh, later on we're going to use gravity to infer the existence of stuff we can't see. It doesn't even interact with light. It's called dark matter and it makes up most of the universe and we can see it gravitationally but it doesn't interact with light so we can't see it with our eyes or even with any other detector that t detects light uh, but we can see its gravitational influence on objects. Um, we also use gravity to measure uh, the properties of planets around other stars, which we'll talk about uh, when we talk about exoplanets. We can't see the planet directly, but its gravity influences the star, which we can see uh, directly. Uh, and then the really fun thing we're going to do in class today is we're going to measure, I say in class, in the activity this week, we're going to measure the mass of the Earth, which is something we can't see the entire planet Earth. We're just on this one little spot. Uh, we can measure its mass by using some really simple tools.